it happened organically on a train from um, still doing the video game work, um, traveling from Brighton to, to London. Um, I just, you know, I came up with this this little thing, you know, all, probably Pete Rock and Rakim helped because they bigged up the, the um, block party piece that, I did that became quite a sort of cult sort of very bootlegged image. Um, and I did like a little thank you drawing of them. Um, and it got, you know, uh, got a lot of uh, proverbial pat on the backs for it. And sometimes as an artist, you don't know what way to go just to to tick all these boxes, you know. Your to... sketchbook must be crazy. Do you have any sketchbooks with you right now? Streetculturetv.com <laughs> Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London or as central as you need to be. You know the coup, you've been here enough times, you know what time it is. Uh, and for those that don't, welcome. Uh, big shout to all the shares and carers, people who have been clocking for the jump and been supporting worldwide and beyond. Uh, it goes without mentioning. Thank you very, very much. Our sponsors, the mighty GK Nifty Heads, have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gkniftyheads.com and get ready for Hoddle Wars Summer 2024. Um, inside the house. We have a gentleman that spans decades of graffiti into illustrative stuff. Uh, records that you know and love range from Dayla to Wu-Tang Clan to Cypress Hill, Rakim, uh, you name it. Um, the new project Ego Strip, well, not so new, but he's out there and doing it. Um, Breakdancer for back in the day, no less. Uh, and furthermore, that transition from graph to some of the most highest of spec illustrative designs. It can only be one man. Brighton, stand up. Dan Lish inside the place. How are we, sir? Very good. Thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure, man. I mean, the calibre in this conversation alone uh, is, is going to stand the test of time. Um, you've you've moved and shook for all these generational moments and technological moments. You know, how, how did you ever get to this place where, you know, you're being hailed up by certain big artists to get your work on their album covers it's uh the internet helped <laughs> you know and, and my wife um telling me to pull my finger out and get on you know that space all the socials because i kept everything in, in my little black books and uh, although i did you know i was doing traditional graffiti pieces you know the personal stuff was always in little black books, you know, so scanning it or doing whatever and getting it out there to the people, that really helps. And um, I mean, I've sort of been, I've had my fingers in many little pies, you know, the, the publishing side of things as well. So I learned Photoshop and, and all this stuff, you know, during those times. And um, I, I just keep up with, with, with the technologies or whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's a good thing, you know, it's a good tool. I treat it like sweets, though, a little bit, you know, now and again, not too much, you know. It's getting that balance right. Yeah, I get you. There is, um, there has to be a level of curiosity when it comes to diving into a whole new, you know, you're leveling up a skill. You, in fact, you're finding new skills. There's got to be a level of curiosity. What was it like? Because, you know, when I see your art, there's, there's never too much of anything. There's always just enough of something. I mean, that in itself is an art. I mean, my stuff is pretty layered and there's lots of little mini narratives happening. It's the way my sort of ADHD mind sort of works. You know, I join the dots. I can't help joining the dots. And if I'm going there, then, oh, hang on, that means that this is going to happen and there's a shadow falling over that bit. And I can mess with, you know, blurring the lines of, of reality-based stuff to, to high, high fantasy, you know? With, with me little black pen. Yeah, that's madness. I love it. And and it's, you know, it keeps that... Sorry for cutting in, man, but you were saying it's that... Um, it, it's keeping that childlike sort of journey, that sort of um, being in love with the process and seeing what happens, you know. 
that's that's very important for me. How do you retain that? How do you retain that childlike quality, like removing all your day to days, which obviously gets harder as we get older. Like removing all the 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 dust away from the you know the, the kids' child's toy box and getting into it. It's um. I mean, you see, I think it's it's a lot easier for people that are more aligned from the heart. This is my personal view on it, and and you're 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 coming from your authentic self, and I'm still learning to do that. I'm still in the process of doing that, and it, it's just that learning and constant journeying. You know, that's that's the key. Snake thing as well. You just like. If you're not feeling it, just carry on doing it again or do something different. It's, you know, you don't beat yourself up over things that didn't really turn out as you expected. Okay, so taking taking you know one of your heroes calling you up and you know on reference through the internet, or maybe it was a friend of friend. Maybe it was another album cover that they saw. And said, yeah, I'll have a bit of that. And you're there, and you're pulling together. What is the rough framework of your your um, inspired design based off of maybe stuff you've heard from the album? And you're going down that road and suddenly you think to yourself, damn, this is Rakim, this is Wu-Tang, or this is Cyprus, you know, like, and then, and then, and then you might say to yourself, well, oh, I don't know if I got this right. Like how many times do how many times do you have to turn this thing around and and rejig it or reshuffle it and how much of that not imposter syndrome but you know what I'm coming from it's like it, that's it's a seismic you know it's a big wish ticked off your bucket list list right I I just keep try and keep myself in check and, and grounded and just deal with these individuals you know what I'm saying they're highly creative um, sometimes the ego comes into play. You know, and and you just have to find that balance again, and, and make sure they're happy, but also be bold enough to flex your your take on it as well, and, and even disagree with them as well. Really, but you have, have to have you know back up of of what you're talking about. Artistically, I think well, maybe you should do that in the composition here. You know, you know what I'm saying. So sometimes it's it's a lot of uh, massaging here and there. And, you know, we, we majority of the time we mature men and women. You know, we just—it's not like, you know, we were eighteen, nineteen, twenty, just really trying to pay your dues and your egos all over the place. And you know what I mean? You got that battle mentality, and you do or die, and you do some really silly shit. <laughs> yeah, real talk. Um, it's fantastic. I, I absolutely love it, man. Um, how long is the album? creating process from an illustrative side how long does that take on average it, it depends on the on the person the client it's, it's a bit of professional um, if they're eloquent in how they want or their vision and I can interpret it as close to I mean they give me a lot of creative freedom as well so I send them a pencil um, thumbnail rough um, they sometimes they really can't see it in my mind it's clear but to them it's just probably a load of chicken scratch wiggles so I have to get my roughs a bit tighter I think I'm just a bit lazy like that as well but you know I think it, I've got it in my mind here it is what you think and then there's a bit of back and forth and it might be a couple of days back and forth or, or a week or whatever if it's if you're dealing with different time zones patching each other at the right time you know what I mean? so the process isn't that long Really? Wow, that's amazing. Um, because it all started back in the day, didn't it? It all began in humble beginnings. Stanlish, the hip hop head, right? Talk to us about that. Talk to talk to us about that period of time growing up, hip hop. Yeah, I mean, I, I was um, as as I've said a few times before, or maybe other people of, of my generation have said, you know, it's, it, it came in, thanks to the Zoo Nation and the Wild Style Tours and things like this, it came in a bit of a package, probably thanks to Van Barter, you know, getting all the elements in one lump and doing the tours around Europe in the early 80s. 
So I was of the first generation, but the tail end of that. So I was a bit too young to witness those tours. Um, but I still got little snippets on the TV, radio. Um, I was lucky, you know, my dad's American, well, rest in peace, my dad, you know, died last November, but he was uh, Brooklyn born and bred. So he had ex access. I wasn't a city boy. I was born in the sticks in Suffolk. So, but he had access to the, the air bases there, uh, Lake and Heath and Milton Hall. So we would go there bowling or whatever, and I'd get little snippets of things, go to an air show, you know, see little things, you know, little little popping, little dancing or whatever going on. And then um, you, you caught little snippets on, on commercial TV. You know, this is way before, obviously, internet, and uh, you just had the radio and the TV. And if you were lucky enough to have a video recorder that you would, and you were quick enough on that sharp shoot, uh, you know, finger on the pause button to get it, you know, so all these things, I think, because it was so hard to attain and, and to sort of, for me, every little snippet meant so much and it just made you hunger for more, you know, so that's what, and me and a lot of other guys uh, that are, are, are not in the cities, you know, made you quite hungry and, and on that sort of battle competition level, um, you would hone your, your skills uh probably more privately <laughs> than in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm talking like 14, 13, 14 years old. And, the, you know, where you can go transport-wise and everything, you're broke. You haven't, you know, it's very local. So the only access points aren't going to be that screen or that radio, you know. Um, and then when that buzz that initial buzz and that energy sort of circulates is a ripple effect isn't there and you, you meet heads you know that at school there's probably one or two other lads that understood what it was and um you know we just embraced that and went with it you it's know? amazing that ripple effect isn't it the whole, the whole it's, it's almost like you're, you're, you're chasing the energy it's uh it's an addiction isn't it like when you especially when you're from the sticks because i'm from the, i'm originally from the sticks as well and it's you look it's through the looking glass you see these things happen isn't it and you want more of it <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's it's a it's just a beautiful thing that happened and um you know i had a lot of of stuff going on so it's a very good sort of vehicle but unbeknown to me Back then, only as a mature man, I can look back now and think, well, that was a really good vehicle to express the energy and anger that I had in me and an outlet to be heard and to be seen and just appreciated, you know, because of uh, certain fam family difficulties. Um, so it was a great, great, um, I wouldn't say tool because that sounds like a selfish thing, but... Um, and, and, and again, when you're sort of 13, 14 years old, you just, you're not even thinking about stuff like that, are you? Because, it's, you know, this is incredible music that you've never heard before. And and you're very much a minority there, but it feels extra special. <laughs> Yo, definitely a minority for its time, without question. If it, it, you know, pubs, Ben Sherman's and Clark's, you know, it's just... <laughs> you used to break as well, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that was the first... That was the first, being a visual person, that was the first flick of the flame. You know, what the heck are they doing? And it was like this strange music that's coming with it as well. It was like quite aggressive, but I mean, funky, you know what I mean? I could feel I could feel the soul in it because I used to jump around and <laughs> on my space hopper to my mum's Otis Reading records and stuff like that. So I could, I still had that, in in there you know what i mean so i could see wow this is this is so interesting and it was the b-boy thing that that really caught my attention first then the music oh probably maybe the both maybe both i don't know and then because it was main i wouldn't say main instrumental but a lot of the electro funk records that we've danced into had like raps peppered throughout it so i was mainly into the funk and the energy of the music and then when it started getting more rhyme heavy, obviously styles changed and everything. And I went with that, but um, 
even in my age now, I tend to go back to instrumental style music and not so lyric lyric heavy. So it definitely had a, an effect on my taste of music. Yeah, instrumentally, that was kind of a time you had you had the Mowax and the Ninja Tune and all these kind of different projects, DJ Food and Vadim and you know DJ Shadow. Yeah, I know that 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 become like a soundtrack to anybody doing anything you know hip hop related wasn't it you know the rap rap was another side of it but the producers were really taking a lead at, 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 at one point or another in the mid 90s weren't they yes yeah, right i mean to be honest I, I was still doing pirate radio in the mid 90s as well and i was finding it harder because of the the onset of of corporate tentacles you know getting into things and the you know labels forcing their artists to change their lyrics and to go down more of a grimy street than just more do you know what i'm saying it's a huge topic man but i i started to go back to my b-boy roots in, in the mid 90s early early mid 90s i would say i mean these years they're, they're quite huge in that whole several golden eras of, of, of hip hop, especially rap music. Um, and it depends on, on your age as well and, and the generation you're from, what, what golden era you were talking about, really. This is gold dust. The, the part radios are very special, you know, and, and, and I was on the South Coast then uh, in, in Portsmouth. So um, it's quite, a, you know what I mean, a heavy, heavy town, uh, with a lot of unemployment or whatever. And... Um, so we were holding our ground to say a small little hip hop community and uh, the pirate radio station meant a lot to me and, and to others, you know, and um, things sort of snowballed off of that or, you know, you, you meet other people, you know, your connections grow. What did you used to write back in the day? Um, it was Deuce, D-U-C-E. Um, before that, there was a lot of other, you know, you go through several stages of very funny tags and, and you know, trying your trying your best to, to sound cool and, and make sure it looks cool, you know, with these three or four letters you've got in front of you, you know. So it yeah. do. Um, I always like that the way it sounded. Um, well, I have to I have to tell you uh, in this juncture that we actually have met before, back in the day. You gave me a flyer, and I think it was at Crafty Cuts across the tracks record store. Yeah, it might have been for the go-off. The go-off was what it was, and it was a wolf. It was a wolf break dancer. The manager of doing a flare. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a wolf. I've got to practice my mandrels. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a, a baboonish type gibbon um, with very short legs doing a flare. And, um, that was when I was hanging very tight with, with James Lacey, rest in peace. Uh, rest in peace. So we would, you know, and that was when I was practicing. You can tell I'm getting all like excited now, when you know, because just I guess it's reminiscing. But the the energy there was just explosive, and getting the chance to practice with, you know, second to none boys and, and learn a lot from them as well. So all this was snowballing. It was all that true school stuff going on as well, like ninety two, ninety three, you know, what well, pre that as well, and and Zoom Nation before. You know, it had a big wobble. <laughs> yeah. um, audience, um, and and by then I'm sort of in my early twenties, so you sort of can carry yourself a bit better. You're a bit more confident, and you, you you you've got a bit more of a precise sort of view on, on not not precise view, but you know what you need to do to get there. You know what I mean? Instead of sort of floundering when you you're younger. Yeah, for sure. At that time when you. Because we only chatted for a bit, but I remember your name because you had Deuce written on the flyer, and we we chatted in, in the in the shop. I must have been easily about fourteen or thirteen or fourteen. But um, it what flyers like that do to you when you're a kid, and I know you'll recognise this is not only is it like a lifeline of something going on and happening and being far too young to go to the club. You understand, but <laughs> but it's. It was significant of its time because, like you say, there was this renaissance that was, uh, uh, you know, it was almost like the first time around, it was just kids having fun. The second time around was the kids were at, 
you know, we've grown up now and this is this shit's serious to take us seriously. Yeah. It had that feel to it. Second to none came through, gave so much attention, knowledge yourself and things like that, wasn't it? I think that was that was ninety seven. That's when I was um, wiring. You know, we take the train up from Portsmouth to Brighton, me and my wife to be <laughs> Karen, and uh, yeah, we'd fly just stick and just trying to make it work, you know. And this uh, is a bit of a student term, you know. It did rely quite heavily on, on the student thing coming through, you know. There's um, so it, it was hard work as well, but we did it. You know, it's, in no sense corny, but it's just totally for the love. <laughs> Yeah, it. I think I ended up playing it. You know, I mean, I played at Portsmouth Beatbox in enough times, but maybe even the go off. Maybe even the go off. Ali took, my friend Ali took it over um, when I left for New York, so he was he was doing his thing with, with Brendan as well. Um, so that's another story. Yeah, that's it, it was going really well, and he managed to bring in <coughs> acts from the states as well. So how come you went to New York? Well, I had always had the, the, the dual nationality because of my dad from Brooklyn. So yeah, uh, shit, the passport. And I was just, just getting that little pillow of, um, you know, a couple of grand behind me just to save up to move out there, just as a bit of a, a cushion if things went tits up. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I've got relatives out there. So, you know, I was very grateful that they, they put me up for a little bit, you know, Flushing, Queens. Uh, Bayside, Queens, uh, Long Island, and then, you know, I found my own place in Staten Island. But I was out there for a year just, just trying to, you know, just uh, get my teeth into it. Even if I was a pot washer, you know, it's just getting into that flow of things in the city, of, you know, get that heartbeat of the city. And, you know, it's really lonely. <laughs> yeah, man. Going out in any of those places from, from the jump, it, yeah, it's it's stark, isn't it? It was tough, man. People say, why don't you just move to London first? I was like, no, man, I've got to move. Because by then, I'm in my mid to late 20s, and I've got to pull my finger out, man, and get there, you know. Uh, dad's from there, and it's like, I, I need to meet my relatives and, and, just, and just hang out and see, you know, I've got myself a single ticket, see how long, you know, and if everything goes to plan. And, and yeah, it, went, it was great. It was like a mad adventure. What's the, what's the craziest, what's the craziest moments out there for that time? Like, did you connect with particular artists? Was, you know, was the one way ticket? Do you know what I mean? Like that's an intention right there. You know, thanks to records like, you know, Coolty Rap and DJ Polo, um, Rikers Island. Um, I, ha I, I built up, certain images in my mind you know obviously south bronx so i had to go to these but I'm not saying i went to work as i although i was invited to dance there and i absolutely shit myself and thankfully it got cancelled wow <laughs> so, you know i'd get like mad performance anxiety if i was dancing because you know battles and all that oh, man, I, I wasn't very good <laughs> i get so nervous Oh man! I so, don't blame you, man. I mean, this, the, the battling is like the last thing really anyone wants to do. But when you get offered, it's like, damn, I've got to do it. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, what was I saying now, man? Um, so yeah, you were you were out there and you were just getting addresses and what you were connecting with people through. I'll stomp around. I'll go to Hunts Point. You know, again. Me and some friends, we'd, we'd all meet up in New York, people from England like Jim, you know, Lacey, and we'd go looking for goose downs, at, you know, at Hunts Point and all these other spots, you know, these mile and par stores just to see what's in the basement. We just had this like fixed thing of getting like these bubble goose downs, you know, the original shitty Korean made ones, that, but they were very authentic, but maybe didn't fit you that well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's Dapper Dan when you need him? <laughs> so, yeah, so um, this is what we were doing, just like, you know, you're, you're, you're with the architects, so we're going to hang out with really old-school writers like Roger, you know, that was, that was pre, you know, they were the 60s and 70s writers, you know, these type of guys. 
and, and the architects of the dance, you know, so like little Dave and, you know, um, I met from Banks through King Uprock. I met a lot of like Danny Boy and all these Clarky and all these older guys that were dancing in, in the late sixties, the connection to the b-boying and all this stuff. Again, just joining more dots, you know, seeing it for yourself. That's amazing. And again, I guess that's that inst that, that b-boy instinct in you. It's almost like the, the, the stars align and you, you end up meeting these people that up to this point were you know, so far removed from the UK, let alone Suffolk, but it's almost like a self-fulfilling destiny that you walk down. Yeah, yeah. And, and to people that are outside of, of the culture or whatever, it, it probably wouldn't seem that sort of difficult to do that, you know, um, especially in the early days of the internet you could be to people but this is pre that in a, in a way only from my ignorance i wasn't really messing messing with the internet then and we still had tape decks that were put in the box even though cds were around and everything it was still more satisfying to put all your, your mix on the on the tape you know your b-boy tapes or whatever just influenced by jim you know lacy and yeah and islam and all these guys flash and all that stuff you know. The early, the early mixtape sound, you know, that's a, a real, um, real big influence on, on the uh, DJing, you know, at these places. That's another story, you know, just DJing for the B boys as well, you know, because I yeah. could dance, I could find a good groove or, you know, keep it interesting. Although my turntable skills were, were pretty poor, to be honest. <laughs> okay. More like basically doubling up, but not on the level of, you know, just catching four bars continuously. Um, I always, I always used to love the DJs that, and and I got big up Dexter from the Brotherhood. He 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 kind of he coined it because you know there's some DJs that only DJ for one specific reason. He, he would be nah, I'm just Brotherhood's DJ. I don't do the DJ in the clubs, and I I love that about you know the authentic b boy DJs. They only do it for the b boys. I love that. Yeah. De Dexter and, and Jim were, were tight as well, uh, so yeah, I've got Dexter, it's, it's great, I need to catch up with him. Um, but yeah, man, just, just hooking up with just with these really interesting people from all different backgrounds and just seeing it for yourself, and that's the important thing, isn't it? Like, just to get out away the screen and go there and do something. Yeah, and it's also the love, like when you you know, when you're in love with something so much, uh, again, you're a conduit to whatever, you know, latches onto your receptors. And... Is it more? That's right. You're, you're well said. You're like a receptor. Yeah. And it it keeps on, it keeps on giving. And the more you let it out, the more you get in, right? Synchronicities and all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's in my humblest opinion and feeling that that is that's b-boyism in its in a in a nutshell isn't it i think you know what i don't know if it's in a nutshell that's in your nutshell everyone else's nutshell is going to be different <laughs> <laughs> big up all the nutters that are still trapped in their shells at this point <laughs> for wednesday come on yeah <laughs> very good then um like you said you weren't really a uh, an internet kind of guy like what 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 spurred you to because you know you you work a lot in tech and computer games now you like album covers are just one of many things like how did you suddenly channel that it's I, i've always just done just different things I've, I've worn quite a few hats i mean it just sounds crazy but sometimes playing in new york i'd, I'd enter a battle finish the battle and then go to DJ sort of like 15 minutes later, just pissing my sweat, dripping all over my records and everything. But I still had that need to, to fulfill that there was something going on there, you know. Um, it's definitely a, a sort of uh, on the spectrum thing, man. <laughs> well, yeah, man, because like some people, you know, they might be all right at one skill. But again, the, you know, the creative in you, it's like you're a multi faceted creative thank you man but i wouldn't say i had much skill in those two previous 
<laughs> it's just like I had to do it. <laughs> yeah, I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fight or flight. Let's go. <laughs> I had a bit of style or whatever, and I was really enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> hey listen enthusiasm gets you absolutely everywhere for real <laughs> yeah i just had a lot of energy just i had to um just get it out and um I, I think the underlying thing as well getting a bit sort of um putting my psychiatrist out it's wanting to be accepted wanting love and, and that acceptance again from your peers and wasn't really getting that at home at the time, you know, when I was a nipper. So that was also a pull as well. You're doing stuff with, you know, with your pals and, you know, it's very important. It's that um, looking, you know, we didn't have many wise elders around us either. So, you know, you're meeting these older guys as well that hopefully they're, you know, they've, um, how can I put it? They're just they're just grounded in themselves that they can pass it on to the the next generation or whatever. Yeah, I think that's so important. It's it in many respects it can feel slightly tribal. Lord of the Flies, maybe even in in. <laughs> yeah, I never saw it like that. I thought, yeah, tribal, right? And then we said Lord of the Flies. Oh man, yeah. Well, it's because it's like the peers that that kind of. I don't know, man. It's like you'll never ever really make them proud, but they become the benchmark of the thing that they're the people, particularly of an age, that you want to impress the most, right? And it it never it drives you to the point where the shackles are off, and actually you you're the peer. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Yeah, you know, I think if you're very conscious of that continuously, I, that person isn't ready. You know, I think it should be. You never know when it's really hard to explain or talk about, but I do an audience that I do understand that it's hard to sort of put it into words. Yeah, it is because once once you're established as well as your own artist and you know, you're in a place of you know, to be sitting down chatting on a podcast and there'd be enough people out there just wanting to hear your story, um you've just been cracking on you've just been getting on doing exactly what you do for all a bunch of different reasons but the last thing you expect is you know that that revered is it reveredness but they're being revered for something do you know what i mean because you're just doing what you do yeah yeah it's um yeah it is a big humble humble pie to them you know so <laughs> um i don't i don't realize that and i'm that's sort of secondary for me doing something of a craft, you know, that I can, it's very sort of um, cathartic. And so it helps me as well, like, I guess spiritually and mentally, physically, not so much physically because of the repetitive strain injuries on, on my hand, you know, but um, the, these things, you know, that button's pushed on that one, you know, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful journey. And when these things come up, like I was, you know, I was very thankful and, and, and grateful for you just giving me a shout. Um, when these things, it always grabs me by surprise because I'm just doing my thing day by day. Well, it makes me really happy that you're on, man, because I'll be really, really honest with you. I, I you know, you're in front of a screen a lot of the times. And, I, and my thing was like, do you wonder if you wonder if even get back to me on this as an idea? Because to me, you know, I had an inkling that you would do from back in the day for starters, but also just the scale in which you work, you know, you've got to be pretty busy a lot of the time. Uh, I, I keep it in check. Uh, to be honest, uh, again, it's that physicality of it nowadays, man. I've just done the same thing for so long. You know, I do have to have moments of rest, you know, from that mental cross hatching you know um so i have to and I, I to be honest i'm at a stage where i can pick and choose projects better than i did I, you know i have the confidence to do that more um because my time is precious you know that's our real currency really that strange thing for the time um i guess more so than the ducats as long as i'm i'm 
feeling sort of um, nourished in what I'm doing. You know, that's very. Mm. <laughs> I really struggle to pull that one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got it. In a way, it's kind of got to serve your creativity and inspire you, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, sometimes there's things that come through that aren't so, you know, creative, but it's a nice owner or whatever the person's called. Um, but a lot of times, like if the weather's nice outside, I'd rather be walking around on the beach or, you know, just playing petonk or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Getting some real insights here with <laughs> Dan Lish. Here. Um, talk, talk to us about the ego strip. Yeah, yeah. Um, it happened organically on a train from um, still doing the video game work, um, traveling from Brighton to, to London. Um, I just, you know, I came up with this this little thing, you know, all, probably Pete Rock and Rakim helped because they bigged up the, the um, block party piece that I think that became quite a sort of cult sort of very bootlegged image. Um, and I did like a little thank you drawing of them. Um, and it got, you know, uh, got a lot of uh, proverbial pat on the backs for it. And sometimes as an artist, you don't know what way to go just to, to tick all these boxes, you know, um and it, it sort of snowballed from that you know he's getting a lot of feedback a lot of interviews from it and i would just love my commutes and, and who the hell likes their commutes you know i, I had my little black book and i would think of like shit yeah let's do cool keith today and any random things that that pop up within around five minutes that's what i'm drawing i suppose because i've got that that lineage or that that sort of that length of time where I'm familiar in my my perceived imagination of that artist, you know, my perception, should I say, of that artist. Um, just go for it. Spontaneous sketching, you know, in pen. Um, in pen? Yeah, yeah, straight pen to paper. The first, definitely the first 25. Uh, and then I started getting into crews and I needed bigger pads and a bit more space on the train. Um, I bet Wu Tang was a real, you know, struggle. Yeah, man, it was. There was a lot of. Um, and if I do make a mistake, I'll just literally have to redraw the head and stick it over what they've done, and then just try and colour in so it doesn't look like the head's been stuck on. But that has happened, you know. Your so, sketchbook must be crazy. Do you have any sketchbooks with you right now? No. <laughs> Sorry, I was. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> I was thinking about when you said I shouldn't have a book. I haven't got any sketchbooks. They're in the they're in the hall. You know, it's gonna. Be to... It's just a mission. It's a mission, Kells. Leave it. Put it away. But, um. Yeah. So a lot of it was freestyle, and, and you know, you felt like a conduit for something more than that. There was something like magical happening um and it was just a beautiful hour from the brighton to to london bridge you know yeah um, blessings so the early ones you know they took a, a couple of hours each and they progressively got more challenging with the, the size of the crews and um that again it just snowballed into projects collaborations with artists you know called key site Hill, Dela and but um, Poss from Day of the Souls, one of the, the, the early guys that reached out. Um, so I helped do some artwork. Well, I did the artwork that helped their album that I can't think of. It was the crowdfunded album, the, what was it, I Am thingy. Yeah, I remember it because it, it was such a, it was such a bold move on their part, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, um, it is a bonkers album. I, I, I still not sitting with me probably as well as it, it it should do, but I should give it more time, I guess. But as I told you, man, my my attention span as far as outtakes, I'm always making up playlists and just digging for bizarre beats, you know, and not listening to too much rap. What kind of stuff do you listen to while you're while you're sketching now then? Um 
it would be oh, I really should um I really should have prepared. <laughs> <laughs> it's very eclectic. It could be a bit of fella cootie or, or you know, a bit then bit of Thundercat or something, Blue Lab Beats or whatever, or then you know, Yellow Magic Orchestra, or, you know, just whatever. It's all over the place. And um I just go by the vibe uh, and if I'm if if I'm drawing an artist, especially for the for the ego strip um, project, um, I would listen to their music or those those bangers that really resonate with me. You know, I'd, say if it's Pete Bach, I'd play the Straighten It Out remix with, with the horns on it, and it was a, it was a lot heavier. So the you know that's just an example. And there'd be a couple of tunes. It's not necessarily um, always that artist, though. It could be some sort of bizarre sort of French library music. But man, titles I'm not too good with nowadays because uh, I guess where I'm not DJing as much or hardly ever, you're not in check with the tactile nature. You know, when you, with all the digital stuff, you don't remember the titles half the time, but with a record, you know, you, you'll know... It's, it's just there it is you know you can sniff it <laughs> yeah of course man like records are precious like that nowadays with playlists you just like let it run yeah that's what i'm saying yeah yeah i feel you um i had a, I had a bit of a wormhole of a youtube session once and i came across like i'm a, a big motorhead fan and you you know, metal covers in general, I think, you know, Tankard and um, Iron Maiden and the likes of these. But in my opinion, they influenced so much of, you know, what became aerosol art graffiti and, you know, and the likes. Um, and and I, I saw this guy, he was the guy that does all the, you know, the uh, the album covers for, for Motorhead. And I just really admired the process of, you know, this is like back in the 90s, raw, you know, raw, heavy duty you know, pencil designs and stuff. And, you know, do you have to go through a, that level of process before taking it onto the screen? With with the Ego Strip illustrations, after I felt they were in a good place, I would scan it. I've got an A3 scanner, so I'd stick the little book, scan it. So then I'd uh, colour it in Photoshop. So, I, and I tried to make it look organic as possible. So I'd make it look quite dirty. And sort of grimy, messy, you know, so not stiff like um, a lot of uh, digital vector art. It's, it's very stiff and a bit soulless. Yeah. Even though the composition is beautiful and they've got the colour values just right, blah, blah, blah. You know, I wanted that griminess, that grit to it, that had been kicked around a bit, you know, for some reason. And, and to be honest, a lot of the early illustrations, I painted them too dark because I was really influenced by um Hellboy. Uh Mike knows Hellboy and, and he does huge slabs of black, very desaturated colours, you know, and I was on this sort of dark moody tip. But when it went to print, I think they were too dark. You know, not not the the the, the content, it was the colour, the tone is too dark. So I've I've sort of lightened <laughs> lightened up a bit not putting so much grime and celebrating colour um, more, you know, instead of it. Maybe it was a lack of confidence as well. Some of it I'd probably hide line that I wasn't happy with. I put a bit of mess there so it cover it up. Because <laughs> that's what it is. A lot of the time you're correcting yourself every, like, five to ten strokes. And because I'm noodling away like this and the train dropping backwards and forward, I can still hold the form, although it's done over many lines you know if, if i did one line to try and do a shape of an eyeball you know even without rocking back and forth on the train it's still quite hard to get you know the, the, the line quality the width and everything so there's a lot of noodling about that is some of the most in-depth insights that i think you know there's some people that really uh can, can be quite quite closed about their creative process but the, the, what you just explained there really does it connects with me because you know when i'm when i'm doing something illustrative it is it's you kind of like working with the energy aren't you it's it's and and sometimes when you clean up that energy 
it 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 really does change the it changes the 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 hum humility of the do you know what I'm saying? Your it, it's like it, you know you're using white out or whatever to make that precise when you look at fresh eyes and you can see. Well, I don't know, man. I I, I hear I what you say. So I think it's a mixed bag, really. Um, but there's something beautiful in in just raw sketches, just, you know that gestural the gestural marks. And I always try to sort of start loose and then tighten up, not not the other way around. I used to be like that, you know, probably influenced by, um, you know, Zaki D and, and, and Mo from Chrome Angels back in the day when I was like 13, 14 years old. They had very precise lines, not so much Mo, but um, um, Pride, the, the very crisp letters and stuff like that, very, very exact. And where I was using rotary pens as well, they're like mapping pens and you've got to got stick them so they're, they're sort of vertically up. It really tightened you up. So I had to strip all that away and, and basically start again. Um, start loose, tighten up. That's the way I do it. God, that's and good. Old Disney animations, the, the, like Jungle Book. You, you see when, you know, Mowgli's like rolling around, you can see the lines, the sketchy lines, and it gives it so much movement and life. That's what, that's what, that's what I love. God, that's good. Yeah, uh, this is such an entertaining podcast. To be on. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's deep. It's deep, and graffiti was your beginnings, which is just in it's incredible. Needling before that, but it might like say it was the b boy, and then the music, and then then like what the hell's going on on that train there? Then it was me, which was you know that came later, and and. And Subway Art, obviously, you know, the most stolen book in UK history, I think. Um, you know, we had to rent ours out from the li local library until it got stolen. And then we had to wait again to get it out. But these scheme, Don D, Duro, all these pieces, you know, Phase 2 and, and everyone in there seen was such a huge influence on us. Because, again, it was fresh and you're just going through the, the, the childlike joy of exploring it, even though, you know, you're trying to be a man, you know, 14, 15 years old, but um, you're still in, you're, it's still brand new and, and very sexy. <laughs> yeah, and just the best, man. What's the what's the future, Dan? What you got going on at the moment? Well, talking of, uh, well, the future, you're trying to be more authentic, I guess, as an artist. So there will be a time where I, I, will, I will focus more on canvases. The gallery. Nice. Shows. Wow, nice. So, you know, it's, it's at the moment, there, there's a little bit of limitation where, you know, the colour inks is ink and wash, which is ink and watercolour. You know, if I did acrylics and then ink over the top, no, that's not really going to work. I really need to... You know, I'll have to not literally put it aside, but I need to advance or, or just to express on the canvas and start chucking paint around. And, you know, because I used to love doing portraiture and oils, and that was in New York. Um, so along with the hip-hop stuff, I was still going to the Art Student League um, just below Central Park uh, with my wife. And, and um, that's it's crazy because she was battling as well. We were both battling. Especially the the, the up rock, the Brooklyn rock. Wow. The art student league can do oil painting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You had to pay a little fee, but it was a lot of learning. So yeah, I'd like to to just experiment more instead of drawing pictures or of other people. You know, I need to just to what's going on inside here, you know what I mean? So it's it's sort of branching out a bit more. Saying that, I'm still I'm working on Ego Strip Book Two because all the artwork is done, and I'm still creating these things. I get a buzz off, but you understand, I need to get Book Two done, finished. Hopefully, as a collector's edition with Book One and Two, the nice little uh, slip disky thingy, um, you know those card holders. I um, can't remember what they're called. Um, get that out, you know, and then 
try something different. Do a Bobito Garcia, you know, like he has a, he's a man of many hats, isn't he? You know what I mean? So Yeah. You know, it'd be nice to to just try something else, larger, larger pieces as well. I love it. That again the dynamics playing and yeah, you, you, you do the ego strip, ego strip too. But then you've changed to you know, you move to this. I mean it's just you know, it it's just extending your palette and keeping you inspired, which we love. My brother, it's been a pleasure having a chat with you, honestly, and uh, seeing you again, actually. <laughs> Much love, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you, brother. Killer Keller podcast, that like in was out of fashion serves you, right? Told you, and if I didn't, then Dan Lich does. Um, Sharon is caring, tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? So look, crime don't pay, but neither did they. Don't talk to anyone, I wouldn't. You stay lucky, all right? Peace. <laughs>